Good evening, Christine. Good evening, Annie. Good afternoon, evening, Elder Hartman. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. And bless God, saints. Thank you so much for being on our live tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to get right into our study after I make a few announcements. If you want to go ahead and turn with me to um, Jeremiah chapter 18, that is where we're going to be tonight after we pray. Lord, we thank you for tonight, and we bless you for your power, and we thank you, God, for your spirit. We thank you for your anointing. We just thank you, God, for being God. We bless you, and we thank you for doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. We thank you for being a very present help. We thank you for being God all by yourself. We thank you for being a prayer answering God. We even thank you, God, for not answering all of our prayers. We just thank you, God. For being available. So God we ask tonight. That you would send your anointing on the line tonight. To do what only your anointing can do. Your word says. That it is the anointing that breaks and destroys. Every yoke of sin and bondage. So God. Send your anointing tonight. Allow the spirit of influence to ride on my words tonight. God that your people might leave. Better off than they were. When they came healed delivered and set free. In Jesus' name, it is so, and so it is. Amen, amen, and amen. Bless God, saints. So tonight, like I said, we're going to be in Jeremiah having a conversation from the book of Jeremiah chapter 18. But before then, let me say that we are coming up on our annual Pentecost celebration. Pentecost will be celebrated on the 23rd of May this year. Pentecost is what we call a movable feast, meaning it's not one set day. Pentecost is 50 days after the ascension of Jesus. So Jesus, he was, you know, we, we know he was crucified. He was dead. He buried. He was buried. And then he arose from the dead. Okay. 40 days after Jesus rose from the dead, he um, walked among men. 
for 40 days. That's when he told the disciples, look, meet me in, um, in, in Galilee. I need y'all to come over to Galilee because I, I want to give y'all something before I go. That's when, when he told them, y'all meet me there. And on the 50th day, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Pentecost is the filling of the church with the Holy Ghost. It is the promise of the Holy Ghost. It's what God said, He's what Jesus said, brother. Jesus said, I, I got to go. He said, and I have to go because if I, do not, if I do not leave, he said, then the comforter cannot come. Amen. So when Jesus left, he did not leave us comfortless. He left us with a comforter. Let me let me explain about this this Pentecost. And uh, I, I hear a lot of people now um, calling Holy Spirit Paracletus. That is same thing. Holy Spirit, Paracletus, Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus, all the same thing. All of it is the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is the indwelling of the Spirit of God in us. I wanted to address this tonight, and I'm going to address it every Sunday and every Thursday between now and Pentecost, because before Jesus came, we had the Spirit of God resting on us, meaning that it would, it would, it would just come and go, come and go. It just, it just rested on us. After Jesus was crucified, dead and buried, and the Holy Ghost came, it came, he came to live in us. Are you understanding? It was Holy Ghost on us, then it was God with us, and now it's Spirit of God in us. Are you understanding? The Holy Ghost does not just make you speak in tongues. It does not just make you dance in the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit makes you live right. Are you understanding? It's a spirit of conviction and comfort that God left in the world by way of Jesus when Jesus ascended so that we as born again believers would have something that would check us when we were wrong. Are you understanding? It's that thing, you know, when people get ready to do something wrong, they say stuff like, well, something made me. Or they were, were getting ready to go one way and, and something made me go the other way. It's that Holy Ghost. It's that Holy Spirit, and every year the, the Spirit, the, the uh, Word of God tells us that we're supposed to observe certain holidays and or feast days, rather. And Pentecost is one of those days. Fifty days after the ascension of Jesus, the church, the body of Christ, was filled with the Holy Ghost. Now. There was a teaching some years ago. I don't agree with it. That says that you cannot be uh, born again unless you fill with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Jesus never said that. The scripture, to my knowledge, if it does, somebody tell me and I'll look it up. It doesn't say that you have to speak in tongues to be born again. It doesn't even say that you have to be filled with the Holy Ghost to be born again. It says, you shall receive power after which the Holy Ghost has come upon you. What does that mean? That means that without the Holy Ghost, you don't have any power. That means without the Holy Ghost, you can't withstand some of the fights that you have to go through. And that probably is the reason why a lot of believers fall to the enemy because they don't have the Holy Ghost in them. Are you understanding? The Holy Ghost in you will make decisions for you that will tell your flesh to sit down when your flesh want to rise up. Are you understanding? You've got to have the Holy Ghost. The Word of God says you shall receive power, dunamis power, meaning explosive power, after which the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Saints of God, if you don't have the Holy Ghost, you need to get it. You need to tarry for the Holy Ghost. The Word of God, I think, somewhere there in Acts, Paul asked the disciples, he said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? The disciples said, we've never heard of such thing as the Holy Ghost. Are you hearing me? This is what we need to understand. A lot of us, a lot of people have never heard of such a thing. Yeah, y'all talking kind of slow tonight. I need your help. Am I talking right? Am I talking left? And I, I know I'm talking right. What I'm saying is that you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Okay. This is what I learned about the Spirit of God. 
because I go to a lot of Pentecostal churches. I just go to a lot of churches, period. And I see a lot of people just dancing and shouting. And I was concerned about that thing at one time because it seemed like so many people was just dancing and shouting. And an apostle, a, a prophetess friend of mine told me, she said, Apostle, just because everybody is in the house of God dancing don't mean they're dancing for God. This is what she yeah. said. She said, sometimes God just have a switch and he whipping their legs. So they're jumping, trying to get away from the fire of God. So let's not think that just because we see somebody moving and jumping and running that they are uh, uh, filled with the Holy Ghost. What I've come to learn is sometimes when the Spirit of God is released into the building and the power of God is so strong, you got to do something. It'll make you run. It'll make you shout. It'll make you cry. The Spirit of God is so powerful that when he comes into a place, he cleanses a place. Are you understanding? Pentecost is very important. We ought to observe Pentecost, thanks to God. And, and so that we will know that this is the power that Jesus left with the church so that we will have the power, he said, to tread on scorpions. And I know people are saying, oh, well, that he, he, he talked about in the spirit. Well, listen, some of us deal with some scorpions right now and don't even know it. But because you have the Holy Ghost, you have the power to be around those scorpions and those scorpions cannot harm, harm you. You have the power to drink any poisonous thing and it cannot harm you. Why? Because the word says so. This is the kind of power, this is the kind of covering that you get from having the Holy Ghost. Not just being saved, but the Holy Ghost. Are you understanding? Are you with me on tonight? Bless the Lord. That's not what I want to talk about holistically tonight. What I want to talk about tonight is from Joshua chapter, not Joshua, Jeremiah chapter 18. If you have it, please turn there with me. Jeremiah chapter 18, beginning at verse number one says, The Lord gave another message to Jeremiah. He said, Go down to the potter's shop and I will speak to you there. So I did as he told me. And found the potter working at his wheel. But the jar he was making did not turn out as he had hoped. So he crushed it into a lump of clay again and started over. Then the Lord gave me this message. O oh Israel, can I not do to you as this potter has done to his clay? As the clay is in the potter's hand... So are you in my hand. If I announce that a certain nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, but then that nation renounces its evil ways, I will not destroy it as I planned. And if I announce that I will plant and build up a certain nation or kingdom, but then that kingdom turns to evil and refuses to obey me, I will not bless it as I said I would. Therefore, Jeremiah, go and warn all Judah and Jerusalem. Say to them, this is what the Lord says. I am planning disaster for you instead of good. So turn from your evil ways, each of you, and do what is right. But the people replied, don't waste your breath. We will continue to live as we want to, stubbornly following our own evil desires. My Lord, that is the word of God for the people of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. They sent word to the prophet. They told Jeremiah, don't waste your breath because we're going to continue to do what we've been doing. We're going to continue to follow our own selfish desires. God's thought for us tonight is let the crushing begin. Let the crushing begin. My sub thought would be what changed your mind? Amen. What changed your mind? So uh, the book of Jeremiah, just this whole 18th chapter is one of my favorite books. And I enjoy reading it from time to time just to see what God is saying new now. 
What 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 is God mentioning now? What what is it that God wants us to know here? believe now and as I was looking today on what it was that God wanted me to talk about and as we look at the news and we look at things that are going on around us and God began to deal with me about the fact that the heart of man has turned away from him but here is the thing he was talking to me from the vantage point of the believers in the house of God. And he began to show me how, no matter how he blesses the body, that the body is not satisfied. No matter how he elevates the body, the body is not satisfied. No matter how he tries to blow on the body and whatever you give him, he, he magnifies and he manifests your desires in the earth. There is a people that are not satisfied with the blessing of God. So I'm asking God, well, what is it that you need for this group of people to know? He said, I need you to begin to remind the saints that I need them to come down to the potter's house. I need the crushing to begin and that the crushing begins at the potter's house. See, I've said it before and I'm sure all preachers and most of them have said this, that a lot of the things that we go through, we attribute it to what the enemy is doing to us. And God told me to tell the saints, don't get it twisted. There are some things that he's allowing to happen because the crushing has begun. He needs you to come down to the potter's house. In other words, he needs you to get off of that place that you feel like that you occupy that is here and come down to where God can minister to you. He needs you to come down to a low place. He needs you to come to his house. Isn't it strange or funny even that the world globally has shut down the house of God, but everywhere else is open? Isn't it something strange that we can go everywhere else and be around everybody's company, but when it comes to the house of God, we choose not to go to church for this reason or that reason or COVID this or whatever your reasons are. You can't come to the house of God, but this is what he said. He said, Jeremiah, he said, I'm giving you another message, and this is the message. He said, I need you to come down to the potter's house. He said, I, I need you to meet me at my house because there are some things that I need to tell you, but I can't tell you those things until you come to my house. There are some things that I need to reveal about you and to you that I cannot reveal until you come to my house. There are some secrets that I want to share with you, but I cannot give you those secrets until you come to my house. Did you ever wonder why the government was trying to keep us or whomever was trying to keep us out of the house of God? Ever wonder why? They're trying to keep us out of the face of God. Ever wondered why the house of God is closed? Maybe it's because the enemy, somebody, wants to keep us out of God's house. Maybe somebody wants to keep us out of the presence of God. Yeah, I hear you say, oh, I don't have to go to the house of God to be in his presence. Saints of God, don't be deceived. The word of God says, despise not the fellowship of the saints. You need to be in the house of God. We get our strength from being in the house of God. We get our strength from being in the fellowship of the saints. We get our strength from getting our hug from that church mother. We get our strength from being in the presence of God in his house. God told Moses this. He told David this. Listen, if you build a temple, I'll show up. If you build a church, I'll be there. Saints of God, if God instructed the patriarchs of old to build the temple and he would show up, what makes us any different? If he told them it is important, it is imperative that you get to the house of God, what makes us think that just live is okay? What makes us think that just parking lot church is okay? What makes us think that we don't have to meet God at his house? I'm a firm believer that you can't fight the enemy on their own property because they have jurisdictional authority at their house. Mm -hmm. But when you come to the house of God, God has jurisdictional authority in his house. 
That means that everything that comes into the house of God is subject to the spirit of God. Are you hearing me? You have to be subject to God when you come in his house. Here's the thing. I've been teaching over 20 years. And I, I, I'm old school. I'm an old school teacher. I'm, I'm that teacher where everything in this classroom is my house. Yeah. So in my house, you don't put your feet on the furniture in my house. So my students know when they come in, well, that time, when they come into Ms. Watson's classroom, you can't put your feet on the furniture. You're not allowed to eat and snack. You can't talk. You, you, you got to follow her rules because she has a set of rules in her house. Here is the thing. If you're my student and you can't follow the rules in my house, you need to leave out of my house. Mm -hmm. And I remember I would always have a group of students that would do everything they could do not to be present in my house. My classroom because they did not want to comply and submit to the rules in my house. Here is the thing. They could run from coming to my class for a little while. But after a while and by and by, somebody saw them cutting class. Somebody recognized they were not in their ELA class. Somebody saw them in the hallway and escorted them back to the place where they were supposed to be. Say to God, God sent me tonight to escort you back to the place where you need to be. And he's saying, you need to be in the house of God because there's a work he need to do. Thank you for your tithe, but that ain't getting it. Thank you for your offering, but that ain't getting it. Thank you for praying for your leaders, but that's not getting it. He said, Jeremiah, this is what I'm telling you. I need you to come down to my house because there's a work that needs to take place and it only can take place in my house. The word of God says, so Jeremiah did as he was told. Wow. Every time I read that, I get full because we have the nerve to go back and forth with God about what God told us to do. And this is the thing. God going to have it his way anyway. So why do we argue and fuss back and forth with God? The word says that after Jer God gave Jeremiah the word, Jeremiah said, okay, God, I'm coming. I heard you. This is what we do. Oh, I hear the Lord saying I need to do this. And, oh, I hear the Lord saying I need to do that. I, I got conviction. I know I need to do better. Listen, in my mind, there's no such thing as need to do better. You're either going to do it or you're not. It's either a yes or there's a no. There's no gray area in God. That's what he said. Look, I don't care if you're hot. I don't care if you're cold. I just don't want you to be lukewarm. Say to God, the crushing has begun. And the reason why some of us, myself included, is feeling the crushing is because we need to get down to a lower place. We need to meet God in his house. When he calls for us, we need to come. Isn't it amazing in the natural? Sometimes our parents can call for us and we don't go. But if they get sick and then call for us, bam, we show up just like that. Why is it that God has to crush us to a place where we're bleeding both internally and externally before we show up the way God wants us to show up? Why does God have to allow so much crushing to happen before we say, God, I'm coming to your house. God, I heard you when you called me. I was just being disobedient and I didn't come. But God, I hear you now. If you will forgive me of my disobedience, God, I'm coming today, not tomorrow, but God, I'm coming today. Are you hearing me, saints? The crushing has began. The word of God, so Jeremiah went down to the potter's house. He said, so he did as he was told. As, and he said, when I got there, I found the potter working at the wheel. Saints, this is what I want you to know. Whether you show up to the potter's house or not, he still has you on the wheel. Jeremiah said, I went to his house, and when I got there, he was working. Meaning that God's hand is always on us, even if you're being crushed, his hand is still on you. Even if you're elevated on a mountaintop, his hand is still on you. Whether you're in a valley, his hand is still on you. Jeremiah said, I got there. And what I saw was, he was working at the wheel. He said, but the jar that he was making did not turn out as he hoped. 
Oh my goodness. You mean to tell me that the potter, Jesus himself, God himself rather, is on the wheel and he's making us. And as he's making us, things that he wants us to look like, we're not looking like that. Hear me. So God crushes it back into a lump of clay and the word of God says he starts all over again. Wait a minute. You mean to tell me that I've been giving the enemy too much credit for what God is doing in my life? You mean to tell me that I've been giving the, the enemy accolades for taking me through when really it was God that was crushing me? Saints, God told me to tell you, let the, the crushing has begun. You're in a place of crushing because he has to make you over again. Are you hearing me? God is making you over again. He has not left you. He has not abandoned you. You are not without hope. He is making you over again. He is getting us to a place that when people see us, we don't have to have a jerk. They just know, oh yeah, she been made on the potter's wheel. When people see us, we don't have to be always throwing up our hands and speaking in tongues. They know, oh yeah, she been made on the potter's wheel. God says, I'm allowing the crushing to happen so that I can get the oil out of you. So that all of those imperfections that were on you while you were on the potter's wheel, they won't be on you when you get off. When I put you on display, I really want people to know that you are a vessel that I can use. But before I can do that, I see some problems with you. I see some things wrong with you. You still got a bad attitude. You still double minded. You still cursing a whole lot. You still seeing that witch doctor. You still slipping out in and out of people's beds. You still doing things that you ought not be doing. And because this vessel is not what I need it to be, God says, I've got to crush you back down to a lump of clay. Question. How many of us has God crushed or is crushing back to a lump of clay? He said, I got to start over again. This is the blessing in the crushing is that God is making you new. The blessing in the crushing is God says, I'm not going to throw you away. I'm going to make you new. God is saying, I'm going to allow you to use all of your past experiences for your future stance, but I got to crush you. Because I, I want to make you into something better. I want to make you into a vessel so that when people see you, they will see the power in the presence of God on you. Are you hearing me tonight? Saints of God, I need you to know that you are not being beaten or mistreated or mishandled by the world, but God is crushing you. He's crushing you so he can make you again. Then the word of God went on and said, he told Jeremiah, he said, Oh, Israel. Can I not do to you as the potter has done to this clay? This is God talking to us. He said, wait a minute. Can I not crush you like the potter is doing to this clay? Sound like Job telling his wife, are we supposed to always receive good of God and never evil? Are we supposed to always be up and never down? Are we always supposed to have a sunny day and never a stormy day? God said, so what are you saying? I can't make you into what I want to make you into. I can't mold you into what I need for you to be. I can't make you the apostle or the bishop that I need you to be. I can't make you the mommy that I need you to be. I can't break you down like, I, like the potter has done, the lump of clay. You mean to tell me that you give all of the glory to the enemy? You mean to tell me that you've given up on the fight and, and you really believe that I have nothing left for you? God said, not so. I can do to you what the potter is doing to the clay because I have a message that I need you to get out. And, and this is the message. He says, if I announce to a nation or a kingdom that it's going to be uprooted or torn down, he said, and you renounce your evil, he said, then I'll turn my hand. Saints of God, this is what I want to say to us in our crushing moments. God says, in your crushing, whatever area of your life that he's crushing you in, if you will renounce your evil in that area, if you will go back to God and say, I missed it in that area, if you'll go back to him and say, God, help me to get it right in this area, God says that he will turn his hand. 
In other words, all of the destruction that God would have done, he says, I'm not going to do it anymore. Why? Because you're allowing me as the potter to crush you. You're allowing me as the potter to do with you what I need to do with you so I can make you a more valiant vessel, so I can make you more valuable in the kingdom, so that when people see you, they know that this thing in you is for real. They know that your yes is a yes. They know that you are sold out to this thing. But God says, I got to do something because there's some areas in you, there's some areas in you that need to be crushed. Sometimes it's not all of you. It's just a little bit of you. Sometimes it's not, it's, it's not the greater part of you. It's those hidden things that people don't see. It's those things that you hide and put the best on the outside so folk don't know what you're really struggling with. God said, that's what I'm trying to break. He said, it's those hidden demons. It's, it's those things that, that, that keep you wondering, God, is this it? It's those things that you find yourself fighting with when nobody else knows that you're fighting and they think you're on top of the world, but they really don't realize you're fighting with yourself. You're dressing up every day and everybody thinks, oh, that girl got it going on, but they don't realize you're battling low self-esteem. You're putting yourself together and you're going out in the world and they're saying, man, you're commanding your day and they don't realize that every time you shut your door in your house, you're crying yourself to sleep at night. And they're saying, man, you're a great mom and you're raising those kids by yourself and they always look good and they always got it together and they don't realize you just spent your last $25 on a haircut so they would look like somebody. These are the places where God says, I'm going to have to crush you in. And I need to crush you in those places because I want to make you better. I want to make you stronger. Science says that when we break a bone, and that bone has to be reset, and it's casted and it's been reset, that that bone is stronger after it's been broken. Are you hearing me? That our natural bone becomes stronger after it has been broken and set in the cast so it can heal. What am I saying? When God breaks us, it's because he's trying to get us to a point of being stronger. The enemy doesn't have the power to break us. Here is the thing. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Ghost. The enemy does not even have legitimate authority to break us. He can only come in if God allows him to come in. So when I tell you that the crushing has begun, it's because God has allowed him to come in and begin to expose some places in us that we kept hidden because God said, listen, you've been hiding too long. You're not free. You thought you were free, but you're not free. And I need to get you all the way free because if I don't get you all the way free and I set you before a certain group and the enemy comes at you, the enemy is going to expose that place where you're cracked. That Bless your name. I feel deliverance and I bless you, Jesus. The enemy is going to expose that place where you're not healed yet. The enemy is going to expose that place where you've been running. The enemy, he, he, he never exposes big things. The enemy exposes those little cracks where the water has been seeping through and seeping through and seeping through. And God says, and if the water keeps seeping through, after a while it's going to go from a small crack to the whole side of the vessel being cracked. And when I send you to feed somebody, the water is going to leak on them from you because you're broken. And cracked vessels cannot be filled. you got to let him crush you so he can rebuild you, so he can fill you, so he can send you out to feed somebody else. Say to God, the crushing has begun. And it's God who has you on his will. And because he has you on his will, any of you that know anything or remember anything about pottery in school, you are in control of the clay. As the potter, you are in control of the clay. You are in control of how fast it spins. You're in control in what direction it spins in. You're in control of how tall you build this piece of clay up. You're in control how low you break it down. God says, I want to be your potter. He says, I need you on my will. Can you just come down? Can you stop making everybody in the world think you got it together? 
Can you for one moment be honest with yourself and say, I am crushed. Yes, I'm going to church. Yes, I'm leading a body. Yes, I'm the apostle, but I am crushed. God said, can you just be honest? Can you be honest for a minute and with yourself? See, th that's why he needs you to come to the house. If you come to the house, then you can be honest. See, as long as we're out in the world, we have to do what Paul Lawrence Dunbar said. He said, we have to wear the mask. He said, we wear this mask that covers our face and it shades our eyes. We, we wear this thing, and when, 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 when we finally snap, people don't know why. Okay. For instance, you ought to live in South Carolina and are from the Columbia area. You know this morning that there was a soldier from Fort Jackson that left Fort Jackson with a rifle, got on the school bus with a bunch of kids. He said, I don't want to hurt anybody. He said, I just want to go home. Listen, thank God the bus driver was cool. He held together. He got all the kids off the bus. Everybody is safe. Here is the thing. The young man said, I want to go home. What that translate is, the crushing has begun. He's broken. And whatever they do to make a civilian into a soldier, he wasn't ready for the crushing. Oh, my God, from Zion. Are y'all hearing me? He wasn't ready for the crushing. So he was willing to get out of Fort Jackson any way he could because the crushing was too much. It was too heavy. Am I talking to anybody today? Has the crushing been so much at times you felt like packing up and said, I'm done with this. I'm done with church. I'm done with people. I'm done with being a parent. I'm done with trying to make everybody else's life easy. I am done. I'm tired of taking care of my mama. I'm tired of taking care of my daddy. I'm tired of having the answers for everybody else. I am done. I'm tired because the crushing has begun. Y'all talking slow tonight. Maybe I'm just talking to myself, but this is what I want you to know. I don't agree with what the soldier said, did. That, no, that from the beginning. But I understood his cry. And his cry was, I need help. He said, I want to go home. He said, I need to get away from this place. This place is breaking me. This place is crushing me. And although that soldier is in an immense amount of trouble, my prayer is, God, let Fort Jackson hear his cry. Why? Because he's not the only soldier that's crying out like that. He's not the only soldier that has been broken beyond his ability to put himself back together. Are you hearing me? What am I saying? We can't put ourselves back together. That's why we got to get to the house. See, he said, I want to go home. What God told Jeremiah is, I need you to come home. Bless your name, Jesus. God said, I, I need you to come home. I need you to come, come, come down to the potter's house. I, I need you to come home. I need you to come home before you snap and then go crazy. I, I need you to come home. Be before you don't have an answer to your problem, I need you to come home. What, what changed your mind? What made you think that you couldn't come home? What made you think that you had to be a whole vessel before you came and sat on the potter's wheel? What made you think that you had to have it all together before you came and laid your head in the bosom of God? What made you think that you had to be 100 and on point before God could use you? What made you think that, Jeremiah? He said, who changed your mind? Who changed your mind? There was a season where you knew that I needed to come to God broken. There was a season that you knew that God accepted my brokenness. But who changed your mind? What made you believe that you can, I can't use you if you're broken? This soldier was trying to get home. In other words, he's saying, if I can just get to my mom, if I can just get to my daddy, if I can just get to a place of comfort, even if I'm going to be crushed, crush me at home. Did you hear that? Even God, if you're going to crush me, crush me in your presence. Let the crushing begin in your house. If 
You're going to undo what I thought was right. Then do it in your house, God. Do it in your presence. Do it under your anointing. Do it in the face of people that care about me enough to love me from being crushed to being whole. Saints to God, let the crushing begin. God told Jeremiah, tell Israel, I'm trying to do to you what the potter is doing to the clay. He said, but then go back and tell them this. That if I seek to bless you, and I promise you a thing, but and before you get that thing in your hand, you turn evil and you turn against the promise of God, he said, you're not going to be able to hold the promise in your hand. Saints of God, that's somebody's answer right there. Go ahead on the shout. I said, that's somebody's answer right there. You wondering why he promised it? And you had it in your hand. But God, what happened? He said, because you took your eye off of me. You put that thing on the altar of your heart instead of keeping me on the altar of your heart. You got off the potter's wheel because you thought you had it in your hand and you thought you were at the finish line. <laughs> Somebody is being delivered and I thank you, Jesus. You thought you were at the finish line. So you, you got off the potter's wheel. You put this thing on the altar of your heart. Now you stand to lose it. Why? Because now your motive has changed. Now, this sounds like David. After Bathsheba was in labor and, and, and the baby getting ready to be born, you know, how the baby came about, you know, and in sin. And the word of God said that David, he refused to eat. And he anointed himself and he was laying on the floor before the, bed, the, the door of Bathsheba, looking up under the door. And he was wondering, you know, is the baby going to live? Is the baby going to live? But he, he was fasting and he was praying. But he was saying, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. And renew the right spirit within me. In other words, he was saying, God, I know I'm a cracked vessel. I know I did wrong. I don't want this child, this thing that I thought was the promise. I don't want it to die because I did wrong. So, God, I need you to create in me a clean heart. I need you to do something in me, God. But just don't allow my baby to die. Don't allow my promise to die. Don't allow that thing that you gave me to die. Crush me, God. But don't crush that thing. That sound like anybody. Crush me, God. Take me through. Just don't kill my baby. Crush me, God. But don't let me abort this next thing you promised me. Crush me, God. But don't let that, tr that promise slip out of my hand. Crush me. And the word of God says that once the baby was born and he realized somebody had been delivered. I thank you, Jesus. And he realized the baby had died. He, he got up. He washed his face. And he told his servants to bring him something to eat. And they wondered, what's wrong? Why is he eating now? He ought to be fasting and in sackcloth now. But here's the thing. The deed had been done. The crushing was over then. He had to live with the crushing. Oh, my God. How many of us have had to live with the crushing? Are you hearing me? God bless you, apostle. How many of us have had to live with the crushing? Why? Because when God promised to bless you, we took the blessing out of context and we put that blessing on the altar of our heart. We took God off the altar of our heart and we exalted that thing above God. And now God is saying, no, I will have no other God before me. Let the crushing begin. This is what I love about God. He told Jeremiah, go tell Israel, this is what I want. This is how I want to bless them. If I choose to curse them and they turn to me, I'll turn my hand. But if I seek to bless them and they turn evil, he said that I'm going to remove my blessing from them. God gives us an opportunity, even in the crushing, to get it right. Did you hear me? God gives us the opportunity, even in the crushing, to get it right. As he was preparing me for this lesson, it seemed like everything that today, after 2 o'clock, that could go wrong, did go wrong. And I'm saying, God, what is going on? He said, it's just crushing. See, when we talk about teaching and preaching the word, and you know, it cuts like a two-edged sword, it does. But you first got to walk through that thing before you can tell somebody to come and eat from your table. You got to first go through that crushing. And God wants you to know it's okay that you're being crushed because you're being crushed on the potter's wheel. It's okay, okay that you're being crushed because you're being crushed at the potter's house. It's okay that you're in the place that you're in because God called you to that place. 
and he called you to a place of crushing because he needs you to realize that after the crushing come the blessing. But the thing is, can you stand the crushing? Can you allow the potter to crush you so that he can get the blessing in your hand? Can you stand the crushing? Can you go through the midnight cry? Can you stand the crushing? Everybody want the Paul and Silas suddenly, but can you stand the crushing? Everybody want the blessing, but can you stand the crushing? Everybody wants the oil, but can you stand the crushing? God says the crushing has begun. And he's doing it because he's seeking the oil. He's seeking people to look at you and recognize that you are a vessel that God can use, cracks and all. But he needs you to let him do the work. And this is what Israel told him. Wait a minute. They told the prophet, save your breath. Don't waste your breath. They said, because we will continue to live as we want to. Do you hear this, the re reply from these stubborn, stiff-necked Israelites? These people were the chosen of God. These are people that God set aside to bless. And when the prophet came with the warning from God, they told him, we don't want to hear that. We're not going to change. In other words, they say, tell them to crush us. Tell them to shoot your best shot. Tell God to do whatever he want to do because we're not going to change our mind. Saints of God, this is where some of us have gotten in the house of God. And he warns us to provoke not the Lord thy God. He warns us not to come against what he's trying to do. Not just in other people, not just in other vessels of God, but even what he wants to do in you. Are you understanding? Listen to what I'm saying. Prophetically, I tell you that a time is coming where God is not going to allow his leaders to beg you to do what's right. A time is coming where God is not going to send his prophets to warn the church that they are out of order concerning the things of God. A time is coming when God will not allow the pastor to pat you on the back and shepherd you back to doing what's right. There is a time that is coming where God is going to take vengeance on the people of God. And we're going to have to be willing to pay what we owe God. Are you hearing me? You have to go through the crushing. In the crushing, you have to be willing to submit to God. Okay, I just heard somebody say God is not a vengeful God. That is not true. We live under the grace of Jesus since he came as the second Adam. But God is a vengeful God. God is a wrathful God, and he will have nobody before him. And if you have anything before him, including your children, including your ministry, including your spouse, including your nasty attitude, including your stiff neckness, God will remove those things so that what he desires to happen in the earth will go forth in the earth. Nobody, myself included, will be able to stand against what God desires to do in the earth. Are you hearing me? Say to God, the crushing has begun. That's why when you call your leader, you can't get him on the phone. Why? Because God crushing you. That's why when you ask your leader, do you have a word? They don't have a word for you. You didn't do nothing with the last word. And you didn't do nothing with the word before then. And you didn't do anything with the word from five years ago. And God's still waiting on you to do something from the word from 20 years ago. You want a word today, but the word you got 40 years ago still waiting to manifest in your life. Why? Because you don't want to go through the crushing. You don't want to, you don't want to go through the proverbial valley of the shadow of death. You want to go from glory to glory. Says to God, in order to go from glory to glory, you got to be crushed like Gideon was. You got to go through your Gethsemane. You got to sit with your Judas. These things have to happen in order for you to get to the place that God wants you. You don't just wake up and you're there. You got to be crushed. So the crushing has begun. Think it not strange that you can't get in contact with the same people you've always gotten in contact with. 
God said, because I separated you and I called you to my house. God said, I'm doing the Jeremiah 18 on you and I called you to my house. Why? He said, because I want to crush you. I want to crush you. You look good to everybody else, but it's some, it's some things. It's some things I need to deal with in you. You, 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 look, you look real good on the outside, but that heart of yours, it needs some fixing. You look real put together, but it, it, that, that mouth of yours, it needs some delivering. Oh, you can preach the house down, but the motive behind your preaching, it needs some deliverance. Saints of God, the crushing has begun. And as much as we would like to say that the enemy is exposing, the word of God is very clear. He says the judgment will begin at the house of God. Did you hear me? So the enemy is not exposing anything. God is putting your stuff on front street. Why? Because he kept telling the church, come to my house. He kept telling the church, I want to see you. He kept telling the leaders, I need to speak to you. He kept saying, I need you to go back and get a little bit more education. He kept saying, there's some stuff I need to say to you. And we would not show up. I tell the saints all the time, anytime I have to officiate a funeral service, I tell them that a funeral is a meeting that only God can call. Do you hear me? And people call. A funeral is the only meeting that God will call and people will come. He called a meeting on Sunday morning, worship, they won't come. He called a meeting for Bible study, they won't come. He tell you to come on live, you won't come. He tell you to fast and pray, you won't come. But if God allows somebody to be plucked out from among us, we will pack the house out. For God to say what he been wanting to say anyway. Are you hearing me? Saints of God, it's crushing. It's crushing. And God needs us and wants us to know that he's doing the crushing. And he's doing it because he's been trying to get your attention. He's doing it because he's been trying to get your attention. Do you know how bad people pray or were praying in South Carolina two days ago when those storms were moving through? I mean, like, people who probably hadn't called God's name since pre-COVID was praying that their property and their children be safe from this storm. Crushing. God will do whatever it takes, Israel. That's us. He'll do whatever it takes to get us in a place where we can hear him. Hear me. And just because you're going to church does not mean that you hear him. Just because you're fasting and praying does not mean that you hear him. Just because you're an elder or an apostle does not mean that you hear him. Just because you're on the praise team does not mean that you are hearing him. Because if we were hearing him, we would be moving like Apostle Sharon Nesbitt says, we would be moving at the speed of the Holy Ghost. But we don't. We move like we want to move. We move when we want to move. And then we get mad because God don't move. Saints of God, the crushing has begun. And it has begun in the house of God. So what am I saying? We need to get ourselves together. We need to come down. Meaning you have to submit yourself to the potter. You got to submit yourself to the potter. But what does that look like? Sometimes that looks like you submitting yourself to your leader. So God can work through your leader to crush you, to get you to where you need to be. Are you hearing me? God uses people as an extension of himself in the earth. People like to use this scripture because it's true. They say, my sheep know my voice and no other voice will they follow. Y'all, that's true because that's scripture. But here it is. Some people don't even know what they're listening to. Some people don't even know the voice of God. I'm talking about in the house of God. I'm talking about some leaders don't know God when they hear him. I'm talking about church folk that read their Bible daily, don't know God when they hear him. 
So if you don't know the voice of God, how do you know if God is leading you? I'm not saying that people should not quote that scripture because it's true. But the fact to the scripture is people don't know the voice of God because they don't stay in the potter's house long enough to hear what he sound like. They don't stay at the feet of God long enough to hear what he sound like. They don't press their ear to the heart of God long enough to hear what his heartbeat is. Moses said, look, he said, God, I don't want your stuff. Moses told God, he said, I want to know your ways. He said, I want to know your heart. I want to know how you move. And I, I don't just want this temporal stuff. I just don't want a house and a car. I don't just want a husband or a wife. I want to know your ways. What pleases God? Are you hearing me? He said, come on. The reason why you don't know I'm talking, because you don't know my voice. Well, apostle, how am I supposed to know the voice of God? This is what I teach in Chapin. As it is in the natural, so it is in the spirit. When you're trying to date a new man or woman, you lay on that phone all time of day and night talking about nothing. How you doing? I'm doing good. You had a good day? Oh, that's good. I miss you. I miss you too. Talking about nothing all day long. But you talk to that person so much so that you know what they're thinking before they say it. You know how they're going to finish a conversation before they begin to speak. Why? Because you've spent time with God. You've been still in the presence of God, in, in the presence of that person. You sat there long enough to hear when they sound this way, they're not in a good mood. When they sound this way, they've had a good day. When they sound this way, they might be hungry. When they sound this way, I, I don't know, maybe something going on with them and their mama. You spend enough time with that human person enough to know what they like to eat, what they like to wear, their favorite holiday their favorite perfume or cologne, you know their favorite hairstyle, you know their favorite restaurant, you know everything about them because day in and day out, all day long, you spent time in their presence. Just two months ago, they were a stranger. But today, you know everything about them. Why? Because you chose to, on purpose, spend time with them. Wow. Wow. So you mean to tell me that if I spend that amount, I hear God say, that amount of dedicated time in the presence of God, listening to his preachers preach, reading the word of God, hearing and listening to the gospel being read in song, then I will begin to know the attributes of God? You mean to tell me the more time I spend with him, the more audible his voice becomes? You mean to tell me the more time I spend with him, when I pick up the scriptures, I know what verse I should read and what God is saying to me? Beloved, that is exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying whatever you feed will grow. Whatever you spend time with, you will begin to fall in love with. And because we have separated ourselves from spending time with God, we don't have carriage service. We don't have Friday night fire services. We don't go to church early anymore. We don't uh, go before God on our knees and pray before the service. We won't nobody intercede. Won't nobody go to the church unless you have service. Nobody want to sacrifice time, talent, nor treasure. Nobody wants to do more than the little bit they think they have to do but they want God to show up in a big way. Let me say this. Some of that big way show up has been the enemy. And because we don't know God, we accepted it as a blessing from God, and it was a curse from the enemy. The crushing has begun. Saints of God, and the Lord is saying, it's time to come down to the potter's house. That high-minded spirit you have, it's time to come down. That idea where you think that don't nobody know God but you, it's, it's, it's time to come down. That idea where you think ain't nobody else preaching the gospel right but you, it, it's time to come down. That idea where you think that nobody else's kids are as good as yours, it's time to come down because the crushing has begun. And we need to make sure that when God crushes us, that we can withstand the crushing. Are you hearing me? 
we need to make sure that we don't answer God. Like the Israelites said, they said, well, God, just crush me because I'm going to do what I want to do. Don't be stiff-necked. Don't get in trouble with God because you don't want to submit. Because whatever you're trying to hold on to, I just heard God say, it's for a moment. Whatever you think is going to last, I just heard God say, after this crushing, it's going to be over in a moment. Are you hearing me? What God is doing in the earth, he just needs a few people to get on board. My question is, are you okay with the crushing? Are you okay? Because guess what? I had to get to the place where God, I'm okay with the crushing. Are you okay with the crushing? Are you okay with the going through that? That's a real question. Would you answer that tonight? Yes, God, I'm okay with the crushing. Yes, God, I'm okay with the place I'm in. I don't understand it, but I'm okay with it. God, crush me so that you can make me over. We sing those things, and we don't realize what we're testifying. Lord, make me over, make me over again. Well, he's trying to. God bless you, Sister Deborah. He's trying to make you over again, but you won't let him. The crushing has begun, and the Lord sent me to tell you tonight, That help is on the way. All that you desire from God, it's on the way. But you first got to go through this crushing. You first got to be okay with this crushing. You first got to be okay with coming down to the potter's house and saying, God, put me on the wheel. I fought you long enough. Put me on the wheel. I'm broken anyway. So put me on the wheel. I'm here, God. What is it that you want from me? Say to God, I came to encourage you tonight that the crushing has begun. And God needs you to know that your victory is coming through your crushing. The oil of God, the oil of gladness, it comes after the crushing. But you got to go through it. You got to be willing to go to the potter's house and say, God, I'll take you. God, I'm in it. And my yes is a yes. And God, if it's just me and you, I'm going to hold on. God, if it's just me and you, I'm going to withstand the crushing. God, if I got to go through this by myself, I'm okay with that. Because I want you to make me into a vessel that you can use. Say to God, that's all I have for you tonight. I wanted to encourage you. God knows you're in a tight place. He knows that you're in a crushing place. He knows that you don't know which way to go. He knows that there are thoughts of depression. He knows that there are thoughts of suicide. He knows that you're in a dark place. He knows your finances. He knows your broken heart. He knows your loneliness. God knows every hair on your head. He knows everything about you. And he says, forget all of that. I just need you to come home. Are you hearing me? He knows that you doubted him. He knows that you look for love in all the wrong places. He knows that you made commitments to things that you should not have committed to. He said, but forget about all of that and just come home. He knows that you backtrack on some promises that you made. He knows you don't pray like you should. He knows you don't read the word like you should. He knows that you are fault finding and judgmental. He said, but forget all of that and just come on to the potter's house. He said, because when you get on the wheel, I'm going to crush you. And I'm going to make you over again. He said, guess what? And when I sit you back up on the shelf, if you get a crack again, come back home. And I'm going to crush you, and I'm going to do it over again, and again, and again, and again. He said, I'm never going to get tired of crushing you and rebuilding you to make you better if you just come home. Just come to the potter's house. Meet me in my house. I want to love on you in my house. 
Saints of God, I believe that when everybody get back to the house of God, we don't need to be doing any preaching. We need to just go into full, bless your name, somebody being delivered, and I thank you, Jesus. We need to go into full worship. We need to be laying on our faces all over the sanctuary. And we need to be crying out to God. And we need to be blessing God for who he is. Not what he's done, but for who he is. Who is he? He's Jehovah Jireh. He's the many-breasted one. He's our provider. He's the bridge over troubled water. He's bread in the starving land. He's a mother to the motherless. He's a father to the fatherless. He's your mind regulator. He's your heart fixer. He's your keeper when you don't want to be kept. He's your Holy Ghost. He's your comforter. He's the one that wipes the tears from your eye. He's there when everybody else is gone. God, and I just want to praise and worship you for who you are. Bless your name, and this is where we are. God said, come home. Let me rebuild you. He knows you're broken. God knows you're a vessel that's leaking. He knows you're leading while you're bleeding. He knows you're not healed from when you had to bury your mama. He knows you're not healed from when you were diagnosed with cancer. He knows you're not healed. From when you had to uh, 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 file bankruptcy, he knows you're not healed. Because you're going from bed to bed, man to man, woman to woman, he knows you're not healed. Because you'd have been married six times, he knows you're not healed. Because you just had to bury your husband, he knows you're not healed. Because you've been betrayed by your best friend, he knows you're not healed. Because you were never loved the right way, he knows that you're not healed because you were molested by your uncle and by your daddy and by your aunt. He knows these things. He said, but come on home. He said, that part of you, I need you to bring it home. Oh, I know you smile. Because it's Mother's Day and you a mama. But I see your heart hurting because your mama not there. Bring that home. Oh, I see you celebrating everybody else and your smile real pretty. He said, but I see you being broken because people not celebrating you. He said, that right there, I need you to bring home. He said, I know you confessing that I'm healed in Jesus' name, but you still are sick in your body and it's breaking your confidence in me. And it's breaking your confidence in the men and women of God. He said, that right there, that truth, I need you to come home. Bring it home. He said, I know you trusted me with your marriage. And it ain't what you thought it ought to be. You're not even happy being married anymore. You're just going through the motions. He said, that part of you, bring it home. He said, because now I'm on the wheel. And I want to make you over. And I want to make you over. But God, I want to get it right. He said, you can't get it right till you get on the wheel. But God, I want to forgive. He said, you can't forgive till you get on the wheel. But God, I want to serve. He said, you can't serve right till you get on the wheel. But God, I want to love. He said, you don't even know how to receive love until you get on the wheel. But God, I thought I was on the wheel. He said, yeah, but you not. Come down. Come down. Come down. Off of all that you think you got, come down. All those college degrees come down. Off that PhD, come down. Off all that Holy Ghost, come down. In other words, don't bring none of that to my house. He said, I want you to come like Job, naked and not ashamed. He said, just come. I just want you to bring your humanity to the house and come. Anybody ever walked in church and just felt like hollering and screaming just because you just got so much going on? You're not crazy. You just want to scream to get it off of you. God said, that part of your humanity, that's the part I need to crush. Come on home. Says to God, God is waiting for the real you. Are you hearing me? I said he's waiting for the real you. My stylist always laughs at me when I go to get my hair done. Whatever I get done, after it's like I want it to be, I say, oh, you look like you. And she laughs. Why? Because when my hair is disheveled 
and it's not like I want it to be, I don't even look like me. I don't even feel like me. But guess what? That's me. Me without the wig. Me without the weave. Me without the sewing. That's me. Me with this bare face. Just me. God said that you before you put yourself together. That's who I want to meet me in my house. And I want you to come naked and not ashamed. Saints of God, the crushing has begun. And I want you to know that God is making you over. And in this season, the enemy will not get the glory for what God is doing in your life. Did you hear me? The enemy will not get the glory for what God is doing in your life. Because this is a God thing. This crushing, it's a God thing. This dark place, it's a God thing. These questions, it's a God thing. He said, and I have all of the answers on the potter's wheel. Amen. So won't you come? Won't you come down to the potter's wheel? So that God can make you new. Amen. It is so. And so it is. In Jesus name. Hallelujah. Bless your name God. Bless your name Jesus. Bless your name Jesus. Lord we love you tonight. And we bless you for who you are in our lives. We thank you. Even for the crushing. We thank you. For the places that we have to walk. That we don't understand. We thank you for bringing us through our midnights. We thank you for bringing us through our dark days. We thank you. For the crushing. Tonight God. We are on the potter's wheel. And we say. Build us again. We say God. Wherever you see any imperfections, make us over again. King of glory, fill this place. Glory, bless your name. King of glory, fill this place. In Jesus' name. Anything that you see as imperfect, continue to crush us, God. To get the oil out of us. So that we can be a vessel. That you can use. And tonight God we love you. We bless you. We give you honor, glory and praise. For the crushing. And we count it done. We thank you in joy. That you don't even leave us. In the crushing. And we bless you for the victory. After the crushing. It is so. And so it is. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen and amen. Bless God, saints. Thank you for tuning in tonight to our journey called Life Bible Study. Remember, the crushing has begun. And God will get the glory out of the oil on your life. Amen. Sunday morning, instead of meeting at our 3 o'clock time, being that it's Mother's Day, we will be meeting virtually at 12 o'clock noon for those of you that desire to meet us during our worship for those of you that cannot please pray for a move of God. Amen. Saints, we love you. Sunday we will begin our new um, series. Uh, pray for us as God navigates us through the rest of this year. Remember, God is in control and the crushing has begun. Amen. Until next time, be blessed. Saints, in Jesus' name. Amen.